pleasure to be here at uh, NC State today to uh, talk about uh, photonic integrated circuits. Um, the talk that I'm going to give is a, a modified and uh, more current version of uh, a few of the plenary talks that I gave last year that reviewed uh, both some of the history as well as uh, current status of photonic integration uh, as well as some view into the future. Um, so that's what I'm going to talk about today. Uh, with that, I have had uh, a fair amount of help from people to aggregate some of the history and current status, uh, including those shown here in the photonic IC field, as well as from a large number of people that have contributed to this work at Infinera as well. Um, as, uh, as you heard maybe from a little bit of the bio, I've spent uh, the vast majority of my career uh, looking on how to create technology, to create products, to uh, how to impact the world. Um, so when I talk today about photonic integration, I'm going to really do it through the lens of what is important for commercial technologies and commercial applications. So that'll be the orientation of this talk. As I go through the talk, one of the things that I'll really highlight is innovation. And uh, for me, innovation is largely about the people. So as part of this, I will also try to bring out some of the key people that have contributed uh, to many of the innovations. Um, and just as an example, I uh, just wanted to show, uh, this is Fred Kish before commercial photonic <laughs> integration, and this is Fred Kish after commercial photonic integration. Uh, my daughters look at this and say, Daddy, photonic integration caused you to lose all your hair. Um, my wife would look at this and say, well, it's caused you to be a much better dresser, but that's because you married me, not because of photonic integration. <laughs> um, but on a much more serious note, I, I, uh, it's, uh, I think the people that have been behind the invention and innovation of this are, are really important. The hope here is to recognize some of those key contributions that have been made to the field. So why do you care about photonic integration? Uh, this is a plot that I'm sure all of, or most of you are very familiar with, this is Moore's Law. Um, and uh, if you could rewind to being back in the industry in the 1970s, um, what a wonderful time would that be to be in that industry, to be in those formative years where there were all of these, you're on the doorstep to being able to invent and create all the technologies that really we've built upon decade upon decade to be where we're at. We're, we've really revolutionized the world uh, from what we've been able to do with the electronic IC. Well, where we sit today with uh, photonic integration is here. And the first reaction to this might be uh, depressing is, uh, gee, we have all this technology, we spent all this time, and we're only here relative to photonic integration. Uh, and what I really hope to show you today is that um, this is just as about an exciting time as if you could rewind yourself to the early 70s. Uh, and we really are on an exponential trajectory here. And the opportunity to impact and change the world in many ways is the same as if you could rewind yourself back decades ago in the electronic IC industry. So uh, as he said, I'm going to start a, with a little bit of a history. I'll try to work through this fairly quickly, but I, but I do think it's important. And uh, as... Uh, my thesis advisor said is that, you know, you, you, inventions don't come out of nowhere. You, they come on building upon the hard work and innovation of others. And so if you really want to innovate in the field, I think it's really important to understand some of the history of the field. So that's why I'm going to attempt to go through here a little bit. And uh, where did the field start? I think it started with the invention of the transistor by Bardeen and Braddon. Um, with this, we had the discovery of the whole minority carrier injection. Um, that then ultimately led to the proposal for and the realization of, for the first electronic integrated circuits uh, in the late uh, 50s and early 60s. Um, and uh, however, when we start thinking about photonic ICs relative to electronic ICs, there are things that are sub significantly different that require different innovations to occur throughout the years. And just to go through a few of those key items, one is uh, photonic ICs require a much more diverse set of materials. Um, so if you look at the devices that are required to assemble an individual laser 
um, or modulator, waveguide, et cetera. Uh, it's generally a much more diverse set of materials that are required. Um, the building blocks required for each circuit element um, are generally more complex and diverse. So we have more different types of devices that we typically integrate uh, into these circuits. Um, that being said, the, the circuits themselves and the applications are less scalable. So we're less able to step and repeat a unit cell or sub-circuit uh, to realize the finished circuit. So that is problematic. Um, also, the fundamental photonic size limit is much greater than the electronic size limit. So the ability to scale photonic integrated circuits uh, from a geometry standpoint is much more limited. And lastly, there really has been a lack of progressively complex and sizable applications that really could fuel or fund reinvestment in the industry. And what I'm going to talk about today is the killer app for photonic ICs, which is uh, optical communications. And that's really been the applications that really has funded photonic ICs. Um, and we're starting to see an emergence of more of these now, but this is where we're really at the really early beginnings of that curve. Okay. Oops. So some of the important uh, foundations uh, for photonic ICs, first was the, the laser that was uh, invented by Maiman uh, in, the 19, in 1960. Uh, in 1961, we had the first demonstration of the ability to modulate light in a semiconductor by Moss. Um, in 1962, uh, Hall, realized, Hall and co-workers at General Electric realized the first semiconductor laser diode. Uh, and that was followed very shortly thereafter by Holniak and co-workers who realized the first alloy semiconductor laser diode. And this was a visible device and was important because it demonstrated the viability of the alloy semiconductor. So at that time, alloys were generally considered to be too riddled with defects to be useful. Uh, and this work actually showed that you could make uh, very viable uh, optical devices using the alloy. And today, the alloy is used in almost every optoelectronic device uh, that is deployed. Also used in almost every optoelectronic device that's deployed is a heterojunction. Uh, this was first proposed by Cromer and Alferov in 63, and ultimately resulted in the first CW room temperature lasers in 1969 by Alferov. Uh, and finally, the opening of the killer app of optical communications or fiber optic communications was enabled by Cow discovering that uh, ability to make low loss fiber optic cable. And this was done in 1966. This all culminated uh, by the proposal by Miller in 1969 for the, for the photonic integrated circuit. And what Miller proposed was that uh, you could via lithography, form an optical system on a chip. And as he stated, if realized, economy should result. Um, now, this was 1969, so the term if realized was a key one at the time because the technologies and building blocks to build photonic integrated circuits uh, had not yet been largely invented. Um, so now I'm going to go through what were some of those key technologies and building blocks that had to be invented to really enable us to build photonic integrated circuits uh, that we know today. Um, so one starts with the ability to build a technology that scales the substrates. Um, we see that uh, as late as 1980, we only had one inch substrates in indium phosphide. Indium phosphide is the uh, material that's used for uh, the majority of uh, photonic integrated circuit applications today. And then in 2004, we were able to scale this to four inches. And this is not so important as to be on par with silicon when you think about electronic integration, but for two important reasons. One, the dimensions needed to get big enough that I could start using the hand-me-downs for equipment for the silicon industry. And I could start to leverage all that learning and all that technology that was created in the silicon industry. And if my, dimension, if my wafers are too small, I can't leverage that. Number two is I need to have my wafer diameter to be big enough that I could actually put enough circuits on a wafer so that when I made a wafer, I could actually get a good one and I could learn from it. And then so when I made the next wafer, I could improve it. And if my wafer is too small, I'm making blanks. And that was an early problem 
is that the yields were so bad and the wafers were so small that there was a lot of blanks being made in the early days of the industry. So the, actually the scaling of the substrate was important for both of those reasons. Um, as we talked about earlier, both the alloy and the heterostructure, heterojunction are important parts of all optoelectronic devices. So the technology that's been developed to realize that over time started with uh, heteroepitaxy, and this was closed tube vapor phase transport. This was first done by uh, Honiak uh, to realize some of those first semiconductor alloy lasers in the early 60s. This was then adopted into an open tube vapor phase epi process by Monsanto in the mid 60s, and then ultimately uh, converted to an open tube metal organic process that enabled the deposition of aluminum bearing alloys as well. And this was done by uh, Dupuy and Dapkis at Rockwell in the late 70s. Today, MO, metal organic vapor phase epitaxy or MOCVD is the workhorse in the industry. Uh, there's, these are reactors that we can literally grow on square feet of material at a time uh, and they enable the ability to grow ultra thin quantum oil laser, quantum oil layers with very price, precise thickness, strain, composition control. As I said, optical communications is the killer app for photonic integrated circuits. So having the alloy tuned to the right appropriate wavelength for transmission and detection is important. And the alloys to do this um, for low loss fiber applications were not developed first into the mid 70s for indium gallium arsenide phosphide. And then later, uh, about a decade later, uh, indium aluminum gallium arsenide was developed. Uh, and this was important in that it provided a somewhat wider band gap, uh, favorable band offsets, and improved growth uniformity in the reactors. In addition, we talked about that photonic integrated circuits require us to integrate uh, many new uh, and different kinds of devices. And in order to do that, we have to change the vertical layer structure of these devices. So uh, two of the most commercially important integration techniques are one, first butt joint regrowth, and that involves growing a series of layers, etching them away, and then regrowing a second series of layers. Uh, and the other commercially important integration technique is selective area growth, which employs uh, masking with a dielectric uh, selective regions on the wafer, and then overgrowing it, and then what happens is uh, I get different thickness, composition, uh, and strain in the regions around the dielectric mask. So these are the two predominant integration techniques that are used commercially today. Um, now that we have all these technologies to fabricate picks, uh, we still don't have an array of building blocks to build picks. And it literally took 40 years to develop the necessary set of building blocks. And I'm just going to run through on this one slide quickly uh, the progression of that. Um, so 3.5 uh, photo detector work started with the first detectors in the late 50s uh, with important advances extending all the way into the mid 80s. Uh, the distributed feedback laser which enabled the integration of mirrors into a circuit uh, as well as higher performance um, for uh, longer distance transmission were developed in the mid 70s. Uh, uh, quantum well uh, technology was developed uh, in the uh, 70s as well and that in provided improved performance on lasers as well as ability to make improved performance on other devices uh, such as modulators, detectors, etc. Um, another important advance was the development of uh, the ability to have strained band gap engineering uh, and this was done in the mid 80s and in fact important work was done here at NC State where Wynn Leidig uh, actually made the first pseudomorphic quantum well injection lasers. Um, uh, in addition, modulator work uh, extended from the 60s all the way through the 80s uh, to develop important advances to building blocks for modulators. Uh, we use optical multiplexers and demultiplexers and a lot of that work occurred in the 80s and early 90s. Uh, and then for some applications, vertical cavity surface emitting lasers are important and those were developed in the 70s with important advances all happening all the way through the 90s. So what you see is that it literally took a period of 40 years 
to develop a, a sufficiently complete set of building blocks that we actually say, I have enough tools in my toolbox that I can actually start to solve real world problems uh, that matter. So, um, uh, so this ultimately led to the first the development of the first commercial photonic integrated circuits, and these were developed, as you could imagine, in the first late in the late 90s. Okay. Um, and as I said, uh, now I will move on and focus on uh, the uh, history of photonic integrated circuits, kind of ending up at where the present state of the art is today, and that'll lead us to a lot of the work at Infinera. Um, so uh, why is optical communications the killer app? Um, I, th I think this is probably pretty obvious, but you know, exponential uh, uh, growth in bandwidth has continued for many, many years. It's forecasted to continue on for many, many years. The question is just how fast or how exponential is it? Uh, similarly, the demand to reduce cost is exponential. And this is something that we fight every year is that uh, not only do the bandwidth requirements go up, but the expectation for the cost reduction uh, occurs, and that cost reduction needs to be exponential. And if you look at these two in aggregate, uh, the only technology that has proven for decades to be able to follow those kinds of exponential curves is the semiconductor. And that's what makes uh, photonic integration really the natural fit uh, to really uh, be the killer app for optical communications. The bandwidth growth, the leading edge of bandwidth growth in the network is in the core of the network, so the long haul network. So that's where we would first expect to see photonic integrated circuits, and that's where we did see photonic integrated circuits. So because they're long haul, we want to use indium phosphide. Uh, that's uh, used for longer distances. And what we see is the first devices uh, that, reduced, that were introduced in the uh, mid to late 90s integrated two to four elements onto a photonic integrated circuit. Um, the first of these was an electroabsorption modulated laser, so a laser integrated with a modulator. These were developed in the mid 80s. Uh, they were not commercialized until about a decade later. Uh, a number of companies did this nearly simultaneously. Lucent was one such key vendor that provided these. And important here was in addition to the advantages that you would conceive from integration, so reduced cost, reduced footprint, uh, improved reliability, what you also see is it provided an additional system advantage, which is that it enabled longer links to be closed. So about two to three X the distance that I could close the length of a link, I could now close with an EML compared to the discrete devices that were, or compared to the direct mod lasers that were being used. Um, and uh, uh, so that ultimately resulted in the first wavelength division multiplexing systems. These were first deployed by Lucent. Uh, the first of these systems were, were deployed in 19, 1996 commercially. Uh, and these were uh, eight waves going to 80 waves at two and a half gigabit to 10 gigabit per second. Uh, and these were the first commercial photonic integrated circuits that were deployed. Um, uh, While well, this provided a one, uh, tremendous increase in how much capacity I had down to fiber, uh, it also generated some problems. And one of the problems is shown here. Um, and this is a list for this product of all of the 40 part numbers that needed to be stocked because now I needed to put 40 wavelengths uh, down the fiber. Uh, and this was a huge problem in terms of how could the industry scale. Uh, fortunately, where integration uh, results in a problem, it also provides a solution. And at the leading edge of providing that solution was work that came out of the University of California at Santa Barbara. Uh, Professor Larry Coldren uh, developed a technology for a widely tunable semiconductor laser uh, where I have uh, two different gratings uh, that I can tune via the vernier effect and actually achieve full tuning across the C-band. Uh, this was the first commercial widely tunable laser. It was the next step up in integration level, integrating four or five uh, functions onto a device, uh, and first came to market in 2002. Uh, since then, there's been three product generations, and over 400,000 units of these have been shipped. Um, and this is the latest generation. Uh, uh, the company Agility was acquired by JDS Uniphase. 
uh, and their third generation at JDS Uniphase is a tunable laser integrated with a 10 gigabit mock sender modulator. Um, and this has been the most successful, so 350 out of those 400,000 were this third generation of device. Uh, and this really uh, utilizes many of the integration techniques that we talked about earlier. So integrated mirrors, uh, butt joint regrowth, and also some relatively sophisticated techniques that are used mostly in 3.5 electronics were incorporated into the processing as well. While the bandwidth was scaling in the core, uh, that resulted in a, the need to scale the bandwidth also on the client side. Um, so that res uh, as a result, surface emitting lasers were commercialized and then these devices were quickly scaled to photonic integrated circuits consisting of an array of 12 devices. Um, and uh, this was first done at uh, uh, Avago, uh, which is now Broadcom, which was then uh, Hewitt Packard, uh, and then later became Agilent. Uh, uh, and as I said, this was quickly scaled to 12 channel devices. And then from there, uh, the focus has been increasing the bit rate per channel. Uh, and today there's 25 to 28 gigabit per channel uh, VIXEL arrays that provide an aggregate band with over 300 gigabits per second. Uh, and those, that's the, uh, cur today's current commercial state of the art. Uh, these devices mostly rely upon this structure, which is a vertical cavity semiconductor laser with integrated semiconductor mirrors, uh, quantum well heterostructure active regions, and then oxide confinement for both current confinement and optical confinement. Uh, and this is used in the vast, has been used in the vast majority of this progression of these high performance uh, VIXEL structures. Uh, Finisar similarly has uh, a similar uh, product portfolio and uh, both of these companies have been on the leading edge from a commercial capability. And what I'd like to point out is that uh, in 2015, if you look at the number of units, that the surface emitting laser arrays are by far the highest volume photonic integrated circuit uh, and uh, are soon projected actually to surpass in unit volumes the discrete uh, VIXELs. So photonic integrated circuits are becoming more and more important and the uh, utility of discrete devices is going away as we require more and more bandwidth in the network. When uh, uh, we talked about the development of the EML uh, and as we see here I'm plotting data capacity per chip versus time uh, that uh, the EML uh, uh, allowed the uh, continued scaling of bandwidth of these commercial devices from discrete to first integrated devices to continue their exponential progression. So for this, the bandwidth was doubling nominally every 2.2 years. However, what you find is that after we got to 10 gig, uh, things stalled out. There was really, uh, things stayed at 10 gig for almost a decade. Uh, and uh, the reason is uh, there are critical problems in uh, again, now and I'm talking again in the leading edge where, we where the bandwidth demands are, so the long haul, but chromatic dispersion, polarization, mode dispersion were critical limiting factors in terms of how do I scale beyond 10 gig. And in order to solve this problem, what the industry turned to is instead of scaling the bit rate is to go to multi-channel 10 gigabit per second dense WDM picks. Um, and, uh, uh, if, if you look at some of the history, multi-channel devices were uh, being developed in research labs in the early 90s. So these are direct mod lasers integrated with a power uh, combiner. And then these are, this is an arrayed waveguide integrated with a photo detector. Um, and ba based upon this and other work that ultimately led to the maturity of the capability where uh, at Infinera we were able to develop the first 100 gigabit per second uh, dense WDM system on a chip. And that enabled, oops, that enabled the continuing scaling of bandwidth. And as I'll talk later, also 500 gigabit devices have been developed and deployed since that time. Uh, so we see that uh, this, uh, can, that photonic integration really has enabled the continued exponential scaling of bandwidth uh, in the network. Uh, and I believe it's going to continue 
to be needed to as the bandwidth continues to exponentially scale. Um, in order to realize these 100 gigabit devices, um, if you look at the integration level uh, at Infinero, what we had to do was take a, a quantum step where you know, people were nominally integrating four or five devices to integrate uh, over 50 devices onto a single chip. And uh, uh, we did that, and I'll talk a little bit about the devices in a second. Uh, and then since then, we've introduced several other generations of devices. And what you see here is, and this is not a fit to the data, uh, uh, but uh, the slope for I, uh, silicon electronics circuit scaling, not transistor scaling, but circuit scaling. And this is about 10x slower uh, than uh, the transistor scaling rate. And I actually think this is the more appropriate analogy to think about when you look at photonic integrated circuit scaling because when we make photonic integrated circuits, we're integrating a local oscillator or a multiplexer or a demultiplexer um, or a modulator. And these things have much more of an analogy of a sub-circuit element or circuit element than they do a individual uh, transistor element in electronics. So I think this is actually the more appropriate analogy and rate to think about when we think about how fast uh, should photonic integrated circuits be scaling. Uh, these are the first commercial devices that we uh, developed. This is a schematic, so uh, it cons the devices consisted of 10 tunable distributed feedback lasers. These are thermally tuned. Uh, they are integrated with 10 gigabit per second electroabsorption modulators. Uh, first generation devices had a VOA only. Second generation integrated a semiconductor optical amplifier and then uh, an arrayed waveguide for a low loss optical MUX. So you see a picture of the chip here. On the receive side, we also had similarly an optical arrayed waveguide for a, uh, arrayed waveguide for a DMUX and 10 high speed 10 gigabit photo detectors. With this, we integrate over 60 functions onto two different chips. Uh, that allows us to replace uh, 20 to 40 packages or in the optics industry, we uh, refer to them as gold boxes and eliminates over 100 fiber couplings. And in the industry, a lot of people think that the chips fail. Uh, actually, what typically fails are the packages and the fiber couplings. So in and of itself, just this re-architecting of the chip results in a much more reliable system. And I'll talk a little bit about that in a few slides. Uh, this shows some of the performance data. So you can see uh, all 10 lasers integrated on the chip. Uh, these have uh, better than uh, 45 dB side mode suppression ratio. Uh, they're tunable. Uh, this is a, a test where we actually forward bias the modulator so you can see the filter functions of the AWG and you can see the alignment on the ITU grid of the lasers to the filter functions. Uh, this is uh, the receive uh, filter function and you see that the crosstalk the, uh, the AWG is designed so that it is better than 20 dB adjacent and total crosstalk. Um, these are the LI characteristics of the laser array and, and, uh, and you see uh, for, uh, reasonable uniformity uh, for the laser array is fabricated on the chip. Uh, these are the 10 gigabit per second eye diagrams. So you see nice open eye diagrams. This is back to back but I'll talk about later that we're able to close ultra long haul links with these devices as well. Uh, this is a second generation device as I talked about. These integrated a semiconductor optical amplifier and uh, the amplifier that we integrated here um, in, uh, had uh, you know, reasonable gain, to, uh, over 10 dB of gain uh, and we did this on purpose. We didn't uh, try to shoot to achieve the highest gain because having this much gain was enough to achieve two key uh, product targets. One was to be able to close ultra long haul distance links. So with this, we can actually close over a 6,500 kilometer link. Uh, that is as good as discrete devices. And that also distance allows you to be able to do transatlantic links. Um, in addition, we were able to provide some uh, uh, initial level of tunability. So we were able to tune over about a quarter of the C-band by tuning the lasers. And why the optical amplifiers are important is because if we do this uh, without having amplification, 
we start getting channel tilt and channel skew. And that winds up causing penalties. So we can rebalance the power by adding amplification. If we rebalance the power by adding loss, then we have too much of a link budget penalty. So uh, now, we, now when we look at scaling beyond these 100 gigabit devices, unfortunately we ran into our same uh, old nemesis, which again are chromatic dispersion, polarization, mode dispersion. Uh, this time the industry actually turned to a different solution, and this is to use coherent communications. Um, and this is an area where, again, photonic integration is naturally suited as a uh, ideal solution. Uh, coherent communications requires approximately four times the number of optical components uh, to realize uh, uh, the link compared to on-off keying. And so because I need so many more components, it really helps to use photonic integration so that you're not just technically solving a problem, but you're economically solving a problem. Uh, coherent uh, receiver work in photonic integration was first done uh, in the late uh, 80s. Uh, and you see work on uh, uh, devices that integrated uh, local oscillators as well as uh, uh, polar, uh, polarization diverse receivers uh, being demonstrated here. Um, a little bit uh, of a primer and for people that, I apologize for people that are well versed in radio, uh, from an optics perspective, this was very new to us uh, when we first started uh, working on coherent communications. But I'm just going to go through a couple slides as to why coherent communications uh, is so enabling in terms of being able to deal with polarization, mode dispersion, and chromatic dispersion. Um, so uh, on the transmit side, you have a source laser. Uh, this will feed, uh, this, the data, the light will be split uh, where uh, data from one polarization and then a second polar to be encoded on one polarization and then a second polarization uh, will feed two nested mock sender modulators. And so these mo mock sender modulators can modulate light between 0 and 180 degrees. And so if I take one of those modulations and then I take a second where I shift it by pi over 2, so I'm now going from 90 to 270, and then I superimpose it, I can get a constellation like this. And so this nested modulator allows me to have two bits per symbol. Um, and then if I put a second polarization where then I rotate uh, and uh, combine the optical beams down a single fiber, I can get four bits per symbol. So that's where I get my 4x scaling um, of uh, my bit rate. But then the question still is, well, why is that good for chromatic dispersion and polarization mode dispersion? The, uh, the reason is, is that both of these are nominally linear impairments on the fiber. And if I can understand what the electric field is, then I can correct for them. The question is, is gee, I've got a, I've got a photo detector. A photo detector detects power. How am I going to measure the electric field? And this is where the beauty of a coherent receiver comes into play. Um, so uh, you basically have an input signal. We split the polarizations. Uh, and then we have a local oscillator that we integrate with a 90 degree optical hybrid and this performs the functions of adding uh, the uh, input signal and the local oscillator and I get all of the uh, 0, 90, 270, 100, uh, 180 and 270 degree terms and then I can uh, uh, either through a balanced photo detector or through single ended transimpedance amplifiers where I actually perform the subtraction electronically uh, with that, so I measure, I'm getting the, again, I'm getting the power, so I'm getting the signal squared, but then if I take the difference of those two, uh, I can actually get both the real and imaginary parts of the electric field. And so if I can do that, now that I know the real and imaginary parts of the electric field, I can go ahead and correct for linear impairments down the fiber. And today, people are actually using advanced signal processing techniques to actually compensate for nonlinear impairments as well. Uh, this could be literally the subject of days and days of talks, but I just wanted to, for people that were more optical than radio people, I wanted to introduce this topic. And what's interesting is this technology actually came out of radio. So 
Uh, it came from a group at Nortel that was working on 512 qualm radio. They had just completed their last development at radio and said, well, what do I do next? And this started in uh, 2000. And that's led to the development of the first optical uh, uh, coherent communications. Uh, at uh, Infinera, we made the first photonic, commercial photonic integrated circuits, coherent photonic integrated circuits. Uh, these were also multi-channel devices. So what these integrated were 10 tunable distributed feedback lasers. Again, you see the IQ uh, modulators for one polarization in blue, the other in red. Uh, these then feed two different optical multiplexers and then off chip, we couple to fibers and then uh, externally rotate and combine the light. Uh, the receiver consists of, again, off chip, we uh, split the light, uh, split the polarizations in the light, and then we feed an arrayed waveguide from two different sides. Uh, the light then gets uh, split out across 10 different wavelengths that then gets mixed with a tunable local oscillator with a 90 degree optical hybrid and then feeds a series of balanced photo detectors on the chip. So you have eight balanced photo detectors per wavelength on the chip. Uh, these devices, one of the things I'd like you to take away is this is an integrated circuit. It just happens to be a photonic integrated circuit. This device integrates over 440 functions uh, and it has the complexity of manufacture of something similar to 90 to 130 nanometer CMOS in terms of the number of mask levels it takes to produce these devices. Um, the, uh, between two chips, we integrate over 600 functions. We replace over 100 packages and over 400 fiber couplings. Uh, so just to give some idea of the performance, these, this is the uh, uh, light uh, current characteristics for the lasers. These are all 10 lasers integrated on the transmitter. Uh, uh, because we're doing, uh, uh, um, we're, we're transmitting uh, and receiving phase, uh, we're really sensitive to phase noise or line width from the lasers. So this is the uh, power spectral density versus frequency, and we see that all lasers are better than a megahertz in line width. Uh, these are the uh, extinction curves of the Mach sender modulator. Uh, and one of the things I'd like to call out on that transmit chip I just showed you, there's actually 40 Mach sender modulators. These are all 40 extinction curves laid on top of each other. So the precision of the manufacturing here is very high to achieve this level of performance. And then again, these are the 10 wavelengths uh, from the transmitter. On the receive side, again, this is the arrayed waveguide. So again, similar filter functions on Gen 1 and Gen 2, 20 dB of crosstalk, uh, the LI characteristics of the local oscillator. Uh, and then these are uh, all of the, remember there's, eight photo detectors times 10 wavelengths on a receive chip, so 80 pass. And for all 80 pass from the local oscillator to the photo detector, um, if I don't engage any power balancing of the variable optical attenuators integrated on chip, I'm still within 2 dB. And same from the signal to the photo detectors. When I integrate power balancing, I actually do much better, but this is actually very important to being able to achieve uh, good optical link performance. Ultimately, optical link performance is measured by what kind of links can you close? And with that, uh, we've been able to close uh, 9,700 kilometer with binary phase shift keying. And this is where instead of using all four quadrants of the constellation, I'm only using two, or 4,600 kilometers for a quadrature phase shift keying. This is as good as discrete devices. So uh, you know, a lot of people ask, does photonic integration provide a performance penalty? And this data actually shows that it does not need to if done appropriately. Another important aspect for commercial photonic integration is reliability. These are uh, data from our first generation devices. Uh, these have been deployed since 2004. And you see we have over 1.6 billion field hours without a failure. Uh, this corresponds to less than one fit. This course, and that's, you know, the analogy is people talk about submarine lasers of typically having one fit as well. Uh, the difference is, is we've integrated, this is for 60 devices, 60 elements integrated across two chips uh, with that same type of reliability. So the chips are inherently reliable and we've reduced hundreds of packages in the system. 
So that results in much higher system reliability. Okay. Uh, from a manufacturing standpoint, and able to achieve that performance that I showed earlier where we had all of the lasers and modulators curves lying on top of each other, we've had to work really hard at manufacturing. And what I'm very pleased to be able to do is to be able to say, on the same slide, I actually can start talking about silicon and 3.5 manufacturing statistics together. Um, and this is wafer fab yield. Uh, this is normalized to 10 mask layers. The red is a benchmarking study that was published on silicon CMOS in the early 90s. And in uh, blue, you see what we've achieved uh, in the last few years uh, in Indian phosphide. So very comparable wafer fab yields. Uh, functional yields, which are how many good devices work, so can I actually, what scale of circuit can I make? Uh, I'm pleased to be able to say that uh, we're at one, uh, better than one defect per square centimeter. This compares to where silicon was in the early 90s. Uh, and this enables us to integrate uh, actually thousands of functions onto a chip with relatively high yields, 70, 80, 90 percent kinds of yields. Uh, and this is all be, uh, due to, and uh, there's a whole uh, set of mathematics we can talk about, about defects and how defects are clustered and the statistics around them, but it's really because the defects are clustered that really enables us to have these kinds of yields. Uh, both of these platforms have been very commercially successful. Um, the Gen 1 and Gen 2 on-off keying platform uh, has captured over 40% of the 10 gigabit long haul dense WDM market. And the coherent picks that I showed have captured uh, almost 30% of the 100 gig uh, long haul dense WDM market since their introduction. More recently, uh, there's been work done in using another system beyond 3.5s uh, that is uh, for using silicon photonics. Uh, and uh, what people have done here is use the advanced CMOS processing to realize filters, waveguides, uh, photodetectors, and modulators uh, to build photonic integrated circuits. Uh, to date, they're still not the ability to integrate actives or actives at the level where the performance is uh, rational to uh, think about a commercial product. So there's also the question of how do I get the actives uh, to build a commercial system. But what people have done to date is integrated 20 to 40 functions commercially uh, for silicon-based photonic integrated circuits. Uh, and what you see here is uh, the very first commercial silicon photonic integrated circuit. This was developed by Luxterra. This has uh, four modulators, uh, four detectors coupled, uh, one, one laser powers all four modulators and all the drive electronics are actually integrated into the silicon as well. Um, the silicon photonics generally uh, uh, leverages the advanced CMOS processing but generally does not yet have the device performance that you get in 3.5. So most of the silicon work has been focused on lower performance applications. Uh, in this case, this is a transceiver focused at uh, very short reach applications and it's been very commercially successful. Over a million have sold to date. Um, uh, for a uh, still short reach, albeit somewhat longer reach, so uh, two to 10 kilometers, uh, Lightwire, which is now Cisco, developed a mod set of modulators integrated with an optical MUX with four laser diodes that are hybrid integrated onto the device. Um, and they're shown here. And this has been successful. This has shipped about 10,000 units to date. Um, more recently, Acacia Communications has developed coherent, a coherent transceiver, so transmitter and receiver integrating everything but the laser or local oscillator. These are focused on higher performance metro applications and they've been shipping this for since 2015. So this gives you a little bit of a summary of the ecosystem uh, and you see that uh, we started with our first picks in the mid 90s uh, culminating today in the highest performance picks that are uh, transmitting at 100 or 500 gigabit per second. Okay. One of the things when people think about photonic integrated circuit innovation is they focus virtually everything on the optical chip. And one of the things I'd like to do is spend a, a few minutes talking about while that's important, 
uh, what surrounds the chip is actually just as important, in fact, if you're going to make a solution that is commercially viable. Um, and as an example, what I'm going to do is uh, talk about uh, the 500 gigabit per second coherent modules uh, that package these chips that I just talked about earlier as an example, but similar examples of any of the photonic integrated circuits apply that we talked about earlier as well. Um, these devices here have a package I.O. capability of 2,000. They're land grid array packages. Uh, dual PM fibers uh, are coupled into the package. Uh, integrated into the transmitter is a silicon germanium uh, mock sender modulator driver. This has 40 high-speed streams operating at 16 gigabaud. Uh, on the receiver, there's a tra uh, transimpedance amplifier array, similarly 40 streams at 16 gigabaud. Uh, on the transmitter, there's also a 300 function control ASIC. It has a million gates in it, and this operates all the control functionality on the PIC. Um, and then there's 24 feet of wire bond interconnect between these two modules. And uh, what, what I'm trying to show, here, show you here is that these are optical subsystems, and these really need to be co-designed with the PIC. And it's not sufficient to say, I made this great PIC if all of a sudden now uh, I can't integrate it with a driver. Or if when I go integrate it with a driver, my PIC needs to be three times as big, because then I've just blown up my economics. So this gives you some idea of uh, what it takes to integrate these devices. This is the interconnection between a PIC uh, and an interposer within the package. This is five layers of stacked wire bonds. This is state of the art in the IC industry as we know it, electronic or optical. This results in an effective wire bond pitch of 20 microns. And just to give you a, a different view of this, again, this is the package. Uh, here's a driver ASIC, here's the pick, an interposer. All this gold is wire bond. And the real key question is, is when I have these high channel counts, uh, I really need to keep my pitch fine because if my pick gets too big, it gets too expensive, I get more optical loss, I lose performance. So I have to keep my pitch fine, but then I have to keep feed all of these RF streams into the pick. And I have to feed all these control functions into the pick. And so how I do that and how do I maintain my RF signal integrity, my integration level, and also how do I manage my mechanicals for reliability and my thermals. My pick sits at 25 degrees C to keep it stable and reliable. My driver is at 100 and my control ASIC is at 75 degrees C. So this is a very uh, important co set of co-engineering that needs to be done while I'm designing the pick. If you do it afterwards, there's no way that you're going to solve a commercial problem. Okay. So I'm going to now talk a little bit about what the future holds. I'm going to do this by first talking about what problems need to be solved before I start talking about a view of uh, what, I think, what I think some of those solutions are. Um, so one of the key problems is uh, the cooling. And what this is, is this is a line module. This is a commercially deployed line module for those 500 gigabit devices. And what you see here is that the heat sinks actually occupy the majority of the space on this board. And uh, there's devices that actually dissipate a lot more power, but they don't have the same cooling requirements because I don't have to keep them as cool. So the, the majority of my cooling requirements are still driven by my optics. So some of the people have said, oh, we're in coherent communications now. My DSP generates all my heat. So I really don't care about how much power my optics uh, generates or how much cooling is required. That's a fallacy. We, this is really dominated by still the optical cooling, and this really becomes a challenge of, as I scale to a terabit, two terabits, four terabits, how am I going to do this? And it's going to involve both new cooling technologies, um, as well as how do I make more temperature and sensitive devices. Okay. Uh, another thing is density. So if I start plotting uh, density versus bandwidth, I see that my aerial density of these packages is scaling exponentially. So this really goes to, again, how am I going to co-design all of these elements uh, when this density is scaling exponentially? And then especially important is the density of the PIC. From 100 gigabit devices to 500 gigabit devices, we've scaled about 10x density in functions per square millimeter. 
And as you can see, what we've done is we've done this largely by going from what I would call more of a linear layout to, you can't see it very well here, but it's a very circuitous layout here. And that's given, that, you know, that and other clever design features has given us 10x. To get to the next 10x, we're going to require far more innovation. And this is, I think, going to be a huge challenge and also provide a lot of opportunity. Um, but uh, we have to continue to integrate the density. This density is still about five times worse in terms of five orders of magnitude worse than what you get in a silicon IC. And this is when people start saying, well, why can't I just do it in photonics? This is one of the fundamental reasons why the density needs to fundamentally change. Uh, and the interconnect, similarly, is scaling exponentially. So first generation had two levels of stacked wire bonds. Now we're at five levels of stacked wire bonds. Uh, and we project future generations are going to require 4,000 interconnects, whereas we're at a few thousand today. People have talked about using advanced modulation formats. So in coherent, we're using quadrature phase shift keying, but people are talking about in deploying 16 qualm or even higher modulation as a way of getting more capacity down to fiber. The one thing I'd like to point out is the distance between each of these points is basically how much tolerance I have to phase noise. And as a result, my relative reach decreases rapidly as I go to higher and higher formats. And uh, today, uh, I think it's going to limit us to say 16 qualm is all I'm going to be able to do for a long haul in the C-band. So there's a fundamental question of how do I get beyond 24 terabits on an optical fiber in the C-band? And that's going to take some real innovation on how we, how we break that barrier. Uh, on the other end of the scale, uh, I think people are aware we're going from single core to multi-core. That drives up the number of interconnects, drives up the, number of, the amount of energy use, but we have a fixed energy footprint that we can utilize to keep devices reliable and, cool and rationally cool them. Uh, that increased with the data rates that are saying I'm going to need 300 terabits of I.O. off of a multiprocessor in five years are driving people to say, can I use photonics to solve the I.O. problem of a microprocessor? And I think that's actually uh, going to be another important area for our photonic integrated circuits. So at home, I've got a six-year-old and a seven-year-old. And one of the things that we say around the house a lot is no more whining. So instead of just whining about all the problems, I'm going to tell you my view of a little bit of what the future, what I think the future holds. Um, and uh, before I get to that, however, I want to talk a little bit about some of the problems of predicting the future. And you see this here. So this is a quote from uh, someone at Western Union who turned down the rights to the telephone. Right. And then uh, similarly, the founder of DEC who said, we really don't need a personal computer in our home. So you can find many quotes like this, but my goal of these next few slides actually, primary goal is to not wind up on a slide like this. <laughs> so, uh, As I said previously, where do I think the future is going to take us? More and more integration. Bandwidth is going to scale exponentially. Uh, we're going to see, see bigger, bigger and more photonic integration. And in fact, we just announced this at OSC this year is our fourth generation. So we're Commercially deployed 500 gigabit now. Uh, we will shortly talk about uh, commercial plans for 2.4 terabit. So these modules, I didn't bring one, I apologize, are both the si each about the size of my fist. So and those that footprint fundamentally hasn't changed very much from 100 gigabit to 2.4 terabit. So now we can put 2.4 terabits in a volume that's about this size. Uh, and uh, with this, we're going to be able to also fully tune every channel, not just over a limited extent, but over the full extended C-band, because these are going to integrate widely tunable lasers. Uh, in this work, uh, these devices have already been developed, and it's just a matter of us getting through them through the systems, final systems deployments. Okay. Uh, in addition, I think we're going to see photonic integrated circuits being deployed in shorter reach applications. We, saw, we talked about some of those with silicon photonics. Um, we also are going to see these also in shorter reach applications with all uh, three fives. In fact, this is an Infinera module that's been commercially deployed for the Metro uh, over the last several quarters. So we're going to see both three five and silicon photonic, photonic integrated circuits in short reach applications. Um, we are going to see advanced modulation formats. 
uh, and it, we're going to push that as far as we can. Uh, 8 qualm and 16 qualm will be used in the long haul. In fact, we can do thousands of kilometers of transmission uh, using uh, these technologies now. But beyond 16 qualm in the C band, as I said, I think we're going to have a problem. Uh, in the short reach market, people are also going to use advanced modulation formats. And you see both Avago and Finisar are working on PAN4 technologies to be deployed using pixels. We talked about the scaling and the importance it is to scale the density of functions uh, per millimeter in a photonic integrated circuit. And this is where I think there's really uh, important uh, opportunity for innovation. And what it's going to require some examples here. And these are some real interesting work. They, they all have problems that still need to be uh, worked on to really be useful. But in this case, uh, Chris Dorr and co-workers basically made a much more compact IQ coherent modulator by using electroabsorption modulators to turn off the various arms instead of changing the relative phase between the arms. Uh, and uh, uh, in another type of device, the question is, can I build devices that instead of uh, having one function per device or a given function per device start to combine functions? And uh, this is an example of that work where we're actually seeing, this is a transistor laser, a transistor LED, where we're combining multiple functions into a reduced footprint. And these are just examples. And think there's other kinds of devices and other kinds of functions. Uh, that uh, this will be a real fertile, I think, area of work for research and innovation in the future. Um, also important is going to be integrating electronics. We're finally getting to the point where uh, 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 it actually matters if you have a wire bond or not, both from the density of what I can integrate as well as the bandwidth of those interconnections. And so uh, good work's being done here. This is an example of work being done in, by Larry Coldren at UCSB. And you can see actually he's integrated uh, an active loop filter uh, to narrow the line width of the laser from 5 megahertz to 150 kilohertz. Uh, fortunately, uh, integration won't be limited, I believe, at least in the relatively mo uh, near to medium term, by what material system you choose. Uh, and these are examples of here of work we did at Infinera where we've integrated over 1,700 functions onto a single monolithic indium phosphide chip. This was done in 2014. And with this, we built a two and a quarter terabit uh, transmitter. So 40 channels operate across one kilohertz in the C-band. Um, people also have stepped up to higher levels of integration in silicon photonics. Again, these are mostly passive devices or in heterogeneous integration where people are wafer bonding indium phosphide to silicon layers. And then lastly, I think uh, uh, silicon photonics is going to uh, really show its primary importance in very short links. So these are going to be things like chip to chip or within chip links. And uh, interesting and important work is being done on this uh, at MIT. Uh, this is a first uh, uh, link that's been demonstrated 10 gigabits per second. Uh, within a 3D chip stack. Again, the laser here is provided externally uh, to these devices. So in terms of ultimately where things are going to play out, I think photonic integration is going to be important and is going to be used everywhere from the long haul uh, all the way ultimately uh, to chip to chip or within chip communications. Uh, I am personally biased uh, coming from the 3.5 world. Uh, I believe that uh, while silicon is going to find its natural home in these very short reach applications, in these middle distance applications, that it's going to have a lot harder time displacing three fives than what I think many people in the community think. Okay. Also, finally, uh, I believe that we're going to, due to the importance of the ecosystem I talked about, leverage more and more silicon packaging technologies. So this is an example where we're taking a uh, two and a half D uh, silicon interposer and then integrating both electronics and photonic integrated circuits uh, onto this two and a half D interposer. And with that, we have an optical system now on an interposer and we can start getting rid of these thousands of wire bonds and interconnections that we talked about. 
So I think this is going to be an important technology going forward for photonic integration. And then ultimately, when we're talking about within chip or chip to chip, uh, 3D photonic IC assemblies are going to be important. So uh, to rewind us back to the, the slide that we talked about, we're just at the beginning. I really want to emphasize this is a very exciting time in the photonic integrated circuit industry and technology. There's lots of opportunities to really invent and change the future. So thank you. <laughs>